Hi, uh, this is Laura Wallace. Um, I guess I'm just a disembodied voice in the room, but um, I'm joining you guys today um, to introduce um, your speaker for the UTIG seminar this week. Um, and uh, Eric Fredrickson. And Eric Fredrickson is a UTIG postdoc. Um, he's working, um, I guess, primarily with me and Damian Safer and Patrick Heimbach. Um, and has really, Eric has done a huge amount to pioneer new approaches to using seafloor pressure data to really um, look at offshore deformation processes, active deformation processes on the megathrust. Um, and he's joined us um, back in August and um, did a PhD at the University of Washington with William Wilcock on seafloor pressure data. And he's really one of the rising stars, I think, in seafloor geodesy. And we're really lucky to have him um, at UTIG um, for a couple of years as a postdoc. So um, with that, um, we'll um, let Eric get on with the show. Thanks, Laura. That was really nice. <laughs> what she didn't tell you is that there's only about 10 seafloor geodesists, so it's not that big of a distinction. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Um, okay, so yeah, my name is Eric Fredrickson. I still consider myself a new-ish postdoc here at UTIG, um, and today I'm mostly going to talk about um, my PhD work, um, but that provides the context for what I'm working on here at UTIG. So um, towards the end, we'll get into um, some talk about what I'm doing in the Hikorangi subduction zone. And um, the photos here um, are uh, hot off the press uh, from the last couple of weeks. I was um, in uh, New Zealand uh, on a ship uh, deploying ocean bottom seismometers and pressure sensors um, in the Hikorangi subduction zone. Great, and everything's working. Okay, so before I get started, I just want to acknowledge um, that my PhD work um, took place on the traditional lands and waters of the Coast Salish people in Cascadia, um, as well as those of the Alutik and Unangan peoples in Alaska. Um, so this is kind of the rough organization of the talk today. Um, I'll kind of give a broad um, introduction on subduction zones and slow slip um, and offshore uh, geodetic techniques. Um, I'll then jump into my PhD work, um, distinguishing oceanographic from tectonic signals on um, seafloor pressure re records in Cascadia, Alaska, and beyond. Um, I'll talk a little bit, if I have time, about some numerical models of ocean circulation and how those can be really helpful in this endeavor. Um, and then finally, um, I will be sure to talk about um, what I'm working on here at UTIG um, with slow slip and hit the Hikorangi subduction zone. Okay, so let's start with the background. All right, so starting really big picture, um, the majority of the world's earthquakes occur at plate boundaries. And so I have a, a map here um, of the uh, Earth's tectonic plates. And if we then superimpose the world's earthquakes, we see that the majority of earthquakes are happening at these boundaries. And the world's largest earthquakes, you know, magnitude eight plus are occurring at subduction zones. And this is a map of Japan here. Um, and these earthquakes are not just happening kind of near the oceans, they're actually happening beneath the oceans. Um, so uh, good, I used the pointer right. Um, we can see here that off the coast of Japan, just a ton of earthquake activity, a lot of that happening in the oceans. Um, and there are a number of other subduction zone processes beyond just these uh, large um, megathrust earthquakes. Um, kind of the most important for this talk is, um, you know, here's a cross section of the subduction zone, overriding plate, subducting oceanic plate. We have kind of our megathrust um, seismogenic zone here, um, some transitional zones, and then um, stable sliding down at depth. And kind of in this lower zone, there have been tons of studies since about 2000 on um, what's called slow slip, tremor, low frequency earthquakes, et cetera, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about in just a moment. Um, and just generally speaking, you know, observing like kind of the full suite of processes that are occurring in, this, in these subduction zones are important for understanding the entirety of the seismic cycle, um, which then has implications for hazard um, associated with these megathrust earthquakes. Um, more recently, um, in some subduction zones, um, uh, there's been kind of shallow slow slip and tremor observed kind of in this offshore segment. Um, so again, just kind of emphasizing that beneath the ocean, there are a lot of um, interesting processes going on. Um, so what is slow slip? Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, it's basically displacements that take place over days to weeks to months, maybe even longer. So very different from regular earthquakes, which happen like in the kind of the seconds to minutes um, type time scale. Um, there's little to no seismic activity. Oftentimes these are associated with tremor, kind of like rumbling seen on 
um, seismographs or um, low frequency earthquakes, et cetera. Um, and they're, although they're slow, they're capable of releasing significant seismic energy. So, um, you know, on a order of, you know, magnitude six or seven. Um, this is an example of a slow slip event out of the Cascadia subduction zone from um, a paper by Kelly Hall in 2018. Um, and the contours here are over the state of, sorry, I'm getting used to using this pointer, over the state of Washington. Um, and basically the colors just show slip rate um, in centimeters per day. And so we can see an event kind of in the beginning of August, um, just starting uh, to form here. Uh, you know, slip kind of spreads out to both the north and south, um, continues to progress over the weeks and then dissipates out. So this event over the scale of about a month, um, seeing this, in this case, this is a magnitude 6.8 um, example that was inverted from GPS data. Okay, so how is slow slip observed? Well, on land, if we go back to our kind of picture of a subduction zone here, and we have, say, a GPS station, um, as the um, oceanic plate um, subducts, it's basically dragging that overriding plate with it. And so this station is going to move to the, in this case, the west. And so we see that in the um, time series here, this kind of steady progression um, to the west. Um, and periodically, we see these movements to the east, and they're taking place, as I said, over the period of kind of like a month, um, or in some cases, much shorter, like over a week. And so these are our slow slip um, signals. Um, and so, you know, on land, easy enough uh, to understand and observe. But many of our land-based geodetic techniques do not work um, off the shelf in the, on the seafloor. Um, they're either more complicated or you know, entirely um, impossible. And so one example is um, using something like GPS or INSAR, um, the you know, satellite um, EM waves are not able to penetrate the ocean um, and get to the seafloor. Um, so those just kind of right off the bat don't work. Um, there are some workarounds for GPS, which I'll talk about a little bit later in the talk. Um, there are also techniques like borehole strain, tilt, et cetera, which are possible, but much more expensive and much more logistically challenging um, in the ocean setting. Um, and so because of that, we have this significant observational bias uh, where we're, you know, really observing everything from the land and very few observations on the seafloor. Um, and here's an ex a map from Japan, um, which is probably, well, probably definitely the kind of premier location in the world for offshore observations. And even here, you can see the significant bias. So don't worry too much about the plots, or sorry, the, the different symbols, but all these different symbols are different um, geodetic and seismic observation points um, on in the country of Japan. And then on the seafloor here, we see they have their uh, DUNET network um, down in the south and SNET here um, off the uh, Japan Trench. And so there are observations in this particular setting um, offshore. These are cabled kind of real-time observations uh, or, or instruments. Um, but you can see, compared to what we have on land, very few observation points. And there's nowhere else in the world that even comes close to this. Um, and uh, this figure on the right here is just a modeling um, uh, kind of investigation by Williamson and, Williamson and Newman um, that just shows kind of how our resolution falls off as a result of this. Um, and so this is just um, a couple of the, the geometry from a couple of real subduction zones, Chile, Cascadia, uh, Japan. Um, and the plot on the bottom here is basically just showing your model resolution from one down to zero um, as a function of trench distance with these different um, curves being um, representing the location of your nearest um, geodetic instrument from the trench. So if you have one at the trench, zero kilometers, you have great resolution, 20 kilometers, 40, 60, et cetera. You can see that resolution drops off dramatically uh, for the offshore portion. So this observational bias has huge consequences for our understanding of the shallowest portion of the subduction zone, which as I mentioned, is where a lot of um, relevant processes are happening. Okay, so this talk in particular is really gonna focus on this kind of shallow slow slip component. Um, but again, there are just, a, there are a number of processes in the shallow part of the trench um, that we just have a difficult time understanding in the absence of seafloor geodesy or, or seafloor measurements in general um, have really significant hazards implications because um, this is where you're going to get your um, generation of your mega thrust earthquakes, your tsunami genesis, et cetera. And there are many other things that we can learn from seafloor geodesy that I'm not going to be able to talk about in this talk. So again, we're just really focusing on kind of this transient um, fault slip component using seafloor geodesy. All right, so bottom pressure, that's the measurement that I use. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about how that works and what we expect to see on it. Um, so basically, bottom pressure is an observation that's sensitive to the vertical deformation of the seafloor. So in my little cartoon here, um, we just have a pressure sensor on the seafloor, and it's measuring P as rho GH, um, you know, with that rho term being density H, the height of the water column. 
And so that can change for a number of reasons. Um, one, there could be, you know, kind of waves or other phenomena passing in the ocean, changing the um, sea surface height that's going to adjust your bottom pressure. But similarly, if the seafloor were to move up or down, that's also going to register as a net pressure change in that pressure sensor. And so we can think of kind of this pressure as being a component of or a sum of different terms. You kind of have some base average um, pressure from your sea, mean sea surface height, the tidal effects, um, what's called instrumental drift, which hopefully I'll have a little bit of time to talk about, um, and then oceanographic effects and geodetic effects. And so what you record is going to look something like this. Um, this is real data over um, just over a year um, that was collected in uh, the Cascadia subduction zone. And here we have pressure anomaly plotted as hectopascal, which is a unit I'm going to use a lot. And it's because a hectopascal is roughly equivalent to a centimeter. So when we're thinking about both kind of oceanographic effects and deformation of the seafloor, centimeters are kind of a useful um, uh, scale to use. And so in black, we have kind of the original data, oops, as recorded, um, which is dominated by the tides. And we can, um, in the case of slow slip, where we're looking at these slow processes over days to weeks to months, we can just use a temporal filter to low pass the data and um, get out a tidally filtered um, uh, time series as shown in blue here. And so this looks nice. We've gotten the noise way down, you know, let's go find our slow slip. Uh, but if we zoom in on that piece, there's actually a lot to it and there's still a ton of signal that's going to obscure any deformation we might want to pick out. Um, so these slow slip signals um, are basically have been observed in only a couple of subduction zone settings and the amplitudes are on the order of centimeters. And so this first graph here is just a zoom of that last one detided. And we see we have multi-centimeter um, kind of wiggles here with some long period stuff that's even larger. Um, there are various kind of steps that we can go through to clean this stuff up. But the goal is to get to this kind of one centimeter slow slip signal. Um, so there's a lot of um, kind of oceanographic noise that we have to get through in order to get to this goal. All right, so now we're gonna kind of talk about some specifics with Cascadia and Alaska about how I deal um, with this oceanographic um, noise issue to get down to the tectonic signal. Um, so the work I did was really based on some foundational studies by Ito et al in Japan and Laura Wallace in Hikarangi. Um, and what I'm showing here are just some examples of slow slip recorded in these settings. This is in the Japan trench. I'm sorry, it's a small figure, but kind of just off the um, east coast of Japan here. Um, and there were just a couple of pre uh, pressure sensors deployed in the water, and they recorded, in this case, in 2018, but I think there was another one in 2011, um, where they recorded some deformation and attributed that to slow slip. And so we see in the time series here, particularly the ones at the top, we have our kind of pressure trace, which again has been detided, going along, and we get some um, kind of slow slip ramp here, and we're now at a lower pressure. Um, Similarly, in Hikarangi, again, off the east coast of the, the North Island in this case, um, we had a network of um, a number of like a dozen um, seafloor pressure gauges. And um, these are the uh, what the data look like, again, over the period of like a year. The scale like, you know, here is centimeters or hectopascals as well. And we see, again, this kind of ramp life signal, which was corroborated by the presence of deformation on GPS um, on the coast. Um, plotted on the bottom there. And so in both of these cases, um, you know, slow slip identified um, on the seafloor, corroborated with kind of some other observations, mostly on shore. Um, but we can see in these studies, you know, the residual kind of noise in these signals is quite large, right? So we're picking out a small signal uh, from uh, some very noisy data. Um, oh, and I should mention that um, in both of these studies, they um, basically cleaned up the pressure data a little by using what's kind of been referred to as like the reference um, pressure method. And so the idea is that um, it's easiest to point to the Hikarangi um, example. You have a number of stations on the continental margin here, um, and then you have a few stations on the incoming plate. And so the idea is that the stations on the incoming plate won't be deformed by any kind of slow slip, um, but they are observing the regional oceanography. And so you take the oceanography, or sorry, you take the signal observed on those incoming stations and subtract it from the others. And it's a way of taking out the oceanography without accidentally taking out your deformation. All right, so that brings us to Cascadia and Alaska. Um, the data I work with um, come from, um, in Cascadia, it was a 2011 to 2015 experiment, experiment called the Cascadia Initiative. Um, and so every year for these four years, ocean bottom um, seismic instruments as well as um, pressure gauges were deployed across the entire Juan de Fuca plate. 
Um, and these were not out continuously for the four years, but every year they were recovered, turned around and redeployed. Um, and so this map here has various symbols on it. You don't have to worry too much about it, but the point being that each kind of color shape combination corresponds to a different year. So we don't have continuous data at any of these points, but rather they move from one year to the next to the next. Um, on the left-hand side here, we have um, a map of the data collected um, out of Alaska. And this was the 2018 to 2019 Alaska Community Seismic uh, community seismic experiment. Um, and in this case, again, OBS and OBP um, instruments um, deployed in the Alaska margin. Um, in this case, it ended up being, I think it was like 14 or 15 months, so a little over a year, but these were not redeployed. Um, and so just like some quick comments on both of these settings. Um, you know, these are active subduction zones with like real earthquake hazards. There were a number of goals that these experiments set out to achieve. They're both kind of these community projects. Um, but one thing I really want to point out is just like the spatial scale of these deployments. Um, so, you know, we're in, in, in the Cascadia case, you know, these instruments, I'm only plotting the ones that are on the margin, but these instruments were deployed over an entire uh, tectonic plate, albeit a small one. Um, in Alaska, instruments distributed like all across the margin here. Um, so these, these deployments really weren't set up in an ideal way to capture slow slip. You know, you're looking for maybe something that's a much smaller footprint. Um, and, and here your instruments are so widely distributed, you, you would just kind of hope that maybe you would catch something. Um, and the other piece I, I kind of want to point out is that in these two settings, there hasn't been any prior evidence of slow slip in the shallow domain. Um, and that's not necessarily meaning that does not necessarily mean that it isn't happening, but in these settings, you have a really long distance, um, from your, your shoreline to your, um, uh, kind of the offshore segment of your subduction zone, your seismogenic zone. So even if you have GPS observations on the coast, you're really, uh, in these cases, um, the kind of resolution issue of observing from the land is, is really strong. So this was kind of like a, uh, I guess what I call in the next slide, imperfect experiments for identifying slow slip. Um, we're going to skip over some of the early processing just to save time. Um, we'll come back to this instrumental drift piece just for a moment uh, towards the end. Um, but we're really going to focus on kind of this, um, I guess, a little bit seasonal and sub-seasonal um, signal and how we deal with that to get to our slow slip. Okay, so here are the data from Cascadia. These have been um, detided um, and... Uh, um, sorry, uh, they've been detided and uh, de-drifted, um, and they're just kind of plotted over the period of about a year. Um, the scale here is in centimeters again, and the color coding just kind of relates to where they're located, whether on the shelf, the slope, or um, out on the abyss. Similarly, here are the data from Alaska, and in this case, I've just separated the shelf and slope um, to kind of better display them. Don't worry about the two colors. They're basically the same thing. We're not, we're not going to worry about that right now. Um, and um, um, what I want to point out, I guess, with these data, as well as with the Cascadia, are just like kind of the similarities of these groupings. So on the shelf, we see kind of a high degree of similarity as well as on the slope. And so based on these data, we wouldn't necessarily expect that reference pressure method to work particularly well. Um, we're taking, you know, the idea of taking kind of an incoming plate sensor, which would be out in deep water, um, and applying it to something um, up on the slope or on the shelf, right? Like we might expect that to, to, to not really work because we're seeing this kind of depth dependence um, to these signals. Um, and so in Fredrickson uh, et al. 2019 and 2023, which were the Cascadia and Alaska studies respectively, I kind of explored this spatial um, homogeneity and how we could exploit that to instead correct our pressure records. Okay, and so the, the way we kind of went about this, I'm gonna kind of jump through or step through how we did it in the Alaska study. Um, is we kind of explore these different proxies um, for your oceanographic pressure and how you could correct that to then um, get out your slow slip signal. So here I'm showing this reference pressure method um, with a station on the incoming plate being the reference for your network. Um, this is uh, what we termed as depth match pressure, where you take a station deployed at a similar depth, um, but kind of distal from the station of interest so that you can uh, exploit that kind of spatial coherence, but be far enough away that you're not going to accidentally take out um, any tectonic deformation. Um, similarly, we created what we called kind of like a network average pressure. Um, and so in this case, we separated the slope um, from the shelf. And in each group, we just summed everything together, um, got like a net average. And so the idea there being you're still exploiting that kind of spatial similarity, but if there is any signal, again, this is a really large network, it's only likely to be on one or two stations. So by 
summing them all up and getting an average, you're kind of mitigating how much of that signal incorporates into the average and is then uh, subtracted out. Um, we explored some additional proxies we don't have time to talk about, but that are really interesting, um, including temperature, um, co-located bottom temperature measurements, as well as sea surface height from satellite altimetry. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't describe this figure as I was going through it, but on the, the left-hand side here, we have in blue kind of the observation of interest. In red, we have our um, kind of proxy correction. So you can kind of visually see how each of those proxies fare. And then on the right-hand side, we have um, the kind of corrected um, pressure after we subtract the proxy from the pressure record. So again, you know, like a good visual depiction that these kind of depth matched and average pressure techniques that exploit that kind of spatial homogeneity um, seem to work really well. Um, another technique that we um, employed are um, CEOFs um, or uh, complex EOF functions. And this is a form of kind of principal component analysis. Um, and so here, what I'm showing in blue are our seafloor pressure, sea surface height, and um, bottom temperature um, records for the continental shelf in this case. And plotted in red are the uh, uh, EOF, the kind of the first component of the EOFs um, for each of those um, uh, ob observables. Um, and so we kind of did this in different ways. We constructed an EOF, a uh, complex EOF, just from the pressure data, and we constructed one that incorporated the pressure, the sea surface height, and the temperature, with the idea being that all of these are um, kind of oceanographically linked processes um, and showed kind of certain spatial similarities. Um, and by incorporating sea surface height and shelf temperature, which will not display any signal if there's tectonic deformation, we're kind of further mitigating any possibility of incorporating our slow slip signal into this correction. Um, but the point being that this CEOF technique, the kind of depth match correction, and um, the network average correction are all means of exploiting kind of um, the spatial similarity that was seen in these pressure records, wherein stations at the same depth have really similar um, uh, pressure, pressure records. Okay, and so if we apply these corrections, we see this really substantial reduction in variance in our signals. So on the left here, I have the shelf data from Cascadia. Um, in black is plotted um, the original pressure record, and in blue is just the um, matched pressure difference in this case. Um, and that's for a number of stations. Um, you don't have to worry about like the details of any of these. And then on the right-hand side are the corrected. Um, records. And so you can just see, looking from left to right, um, that we've substantially like tamped down our noise by applying this technique. Similarly, these are the data from the shelf, or sorry, the slope, which start out with lower variance, but still this correction gets us um, significantly lower. And so something I want to point out is that in both the Alaska and the Cascadia um, data, we not only kind of determined, you know, or, you know, developed this um, kind of a long depth um, spatial correction technique. Um, but we also then went in and looked for slow slip. And in these corrected records, we oops, uh, didn't find any convincing evidence uh, of slow slip signals. Um, and I want to point out that um, the fact that these corrections work is pretty amazing um, because these systems are large and really dynamic. So these are some um, uh, uh, just movies of oceanographic bottom or of oceanographic bottom pressure as calculated from some numerical um, models of ocean circulation, um, and we're just plotting here the um, uh, amplitude um, da daily bottom pressure amplitudes um, over the period of a year in Cascadia and then in Alaska. Um, and you know we're looking over many hundreds of kilometers. We can see all kinds of um, circulation processes kind of propagating through these systems. And yet, despite all that, um, uh, all those dynamics, you know, if we look at one location in, um, you know, the Alaska system, for instance, we look at another location on the opposite end at the same depth, they're experiencing the same bottom pressure, you know, to, to a large degree. Okay, so just because we're able to kind of tamp down the noise, it doesn't necessarily mean that we'll be able to detect anything. Um, so another component of these studies was doing kind of like a synthetic detectability analysis to say if there were a slow slip signal in these data, you know, what size would it have to be in order to be able to pull it out? And so in Cascadia, the approach we took was um, doing some forward modeling of deformation for an event of similar size to what had been observed in Japan and in Hikarangi. Um, and here I'm just con these are just contours of um, 
surface deformation, uplift in red and substance in blue. Um, and then we use those models of ocean circulation that I just showed to create, create synthetic time series kind of in two transects. Um, the first being our kind of depth match transects. So all of these deployed at, well, theoretically deployed um, at like 800 to 900 meters. And then the second one being the more like kind of traditional deployment of a reference station on the incoming site here um, with your stations deployed at a variety of different depths. We then added the um, deformation signal, which we, you know, uh, kind of, we did a number of different um, case examples, but in this case, it's going to be deformation over about two weeks um, and just added that into our um, numerical model of bottom pressure and then um, applied these two different reference types to see how things look. Okay, and so here on the left, we have kind of our traditional incoming plate reference, and on the right, we have our depth match reference, and just visually, you can see kind of the dramatic difference um, between them. Um, the color, so again, we have our, our data over the period of a year, our scale is in centimeters. Um, the colors in red and blue just show where the um, modeled observation points kind of overlap our uh, regions of deformation. And in the incoming plate reference, we can see, you know, there's still a dramatic amount of um, oceanographic noise, and in all the cases except for maybe the deepest observations, it's difficult to pick out that um, um, slow slip signal. Whereas in our um, depth match reference case, um, these different pressure traces, um, the, the ones in red where they're overlying the region of deformation, you can very clearly see that step from our slow slip earthquake. And so we modeled a variety of different scenarios, um, and what came out of this was basically that, at least in Cascadia, kind of using these um, kind of depth matched correction techniques, we should be able to detect something on the order of like a magnitude six slow slip event um, were it to take place. And the primary constraint on that really wasn't our um, signal resolution of the time series, but rather like the small, the, the decreasing size of the footprint of deformation as you went to smaller slow slip events. So if you don't really know where to look, you know, unless you have a you know, station spacing of like a kilometer, it's just like, you're just gonna miss it was really the issue. Um, in Alaska, we took a slightly different approach to how we wanted to characterize detectability. And so what we did is we generated, um, or we, we made an automated detector, um, fed it a ton of synthetic slow slip events, um, kind of processed with all of our different um, um, proxy techniques, and then tried to pull out, okay, well, what can we detect under all of these different techniques? So just like I showed in one of the previous slides, we have kind of a stack of pressure records here, um, just our regular pressure record corrected with the reference station on the incoming plate, depth matched, our average pressure correction, temperature, and uh, sea surface height. Um, and this is just one example um, where we put um, deformation uh, in between like September, October, where these two vertical lines are. And you can kind of just see with your eye um, where that ramp takes place and the uh, traces that kind of overlie our pressure data show where the detector thinks that ramp is and how big it thinks it is. Um, and so we did this for a ton of different um, synthetic events of different amplitudes, different durations and different onsets and basically created a suite of um, detectability results to figure out um, what, you know, what could you actually detect in, in, um, in these data. And we did it for two cases where we know what the onset is. So this would be kind of simulating a Hikarangi type case where you have, um, you know, a coastal GPS station that's able to resolve deformation. So you know, okay, in on September 7th, there was an event. So let's go like, you know, see what the size of it is there. Um, or when you don't know, you're just going in completely blind like we were in Alaska and Cascadia, and you're just looking at the entire data set and trying to pull out um, slow slip deformation. Um, and so with the unknown onset, uh, these are kind of what the results look like. And so you, um, on the left here, we have our kind of predicted time versus the known time. So if it aligns with zero, that means we got it right. Um, and on the right here, we have our predicted amplitude. And this is for just three examples, a, a two centimeter event, a six centimeter event, and a 10 centimeter event. And so uh, with the amplitude set over here, I have these vertical bars that show two centimeters, six, and 10. So that's what we're aiming for. And um, don't worry about the two different colors of the bars here, but basically this just shows the suite of um, detection results that resulted for the um, depth matched correction case. And so just showing that, you know, for a small event, um, only two centimeters, really difficult to tell um, when it is in time. Some predictions get the amplitude right, some don't. But as you increase to larger sizes, you get better and better time characterization um, and better amplitude characterization. 
Um, and for the case where we went in with a known onset time, the results, you know, much resemble kind of these amplitude results where um, there's always going to be some distribution of over and under predictions. Um, and so what we kind of pulled from um, this detectability study, at least in Alaska, was that on the continental shelf, we thought we could um, basically accurately detect and characterize slow slope events on the order of about four centimeters deformation and on the slope on the order of about two centimeters deformation. Okay, so uh, that kind of concludes like the first section of the talk. Um, and just to kind of sum it up in a sentence, proxies that exploit this kind of broad spatial depth dependent coherence of bottom pressure, um, we're able to significantly reduce variance and increase our detectability um, as shown in both Cascadia and Alaska subduction zones and leaving us kind of sensitive to the centimeter scale deformation signals that we're after in slow slope. Um, for the next piece, I want to just talk briefly a little bit more about these numerical ocean circulation models, um, because I think they're really useful. And while I'm here at UTIG, I really hope to um, dive further into these and use them as tools to better understand our bottom pressure data. Um, so kind of the, the angle I guess I'm going to take in talking about this is thinking about, okay, we have our uh, corrected pressure series. And while they're much cleaner um, than maybe what we started with, there's still a lot of residual signal in here. And so my question is, what is that? You know, like what's happening um, in the ocean that isn't being corrected out um, uh, by this kind of different depth match differencing technique? Um, and so to look at this, um, I used a numerical ocean circulation model out of um, the Cascadia region. Um, this is called Live Ocean, um, and it's um, designed by Parker McCready out of the University of Washington. And it's a called a ROMS model, which is a regional ocean model, oceanographic model. Um, and um, what I'm plotting here is just a time, just a, a, a contours of the um, bottom pressure um, RMS or standard deviation, I guess, um, in the Cascadia region. And um, um, you can kind of break this up into components. Oh, I should take a step back. What's nice about these models is that um, you know, it's a it's a three D oceanographic model. So I'm not I'm not just constrained to bottom pressure at a few locations like you are with observational data. It's you know I have the entire water column over this entire region. So while I can you know extract bottom pressure, I can also extract you know salinity, density, sea surface height. Um, I can pick features that are moving through the system, and so I think this is a really powerful tool because I can look at the bottom pressure. Um, but also then dive into the model to understand what are the components that are creating that pressure, um, what are the dynamics at play um, that result in the observations we're seeing at a given point. And so in this particular case, um, in addition to looking at the total pressure, I just broke up the bottom pressure into the component that results from sea surface height and the component that results from density changes in the water column. And I'm not going to talk too much about um, kind of the, the, some of the broad features we see here, but just point out that like these are very different fields. And so you have these kind of, you kind of think of it as like these two contributions to the oceanographic um, bottom pressure, um, either of which may be um, causing kind of residual signals on our pressure data that are going to get conflated with the desired slow slip um, deformation. Um, skip that. And so um, what I'll show here is just a pressure trace at a given location um, where I've broken up those different components. So the red trace is our total pressure. Um, blue is our steric um, or our uh, water column kind of contribution. And then the yellow is our sea surface height uh, contribution. And really just emphasizing that these components are quite different from one another. Um, and then if I, instead of plotting a single location, I plot a difference. So a, uh, a match depth difference, a pressure, bottom pressure at one location, bottom pressure at another far away, but at the same depth. Um, this is uh, what those differences look like, again, broken up by those components. And what I want to point out here that's kind of of interest is that when we, in this particular case, we see this ramp-like signal, which is something that might confuse us as being a slow slip um, deformation. And in this particular case, the um, sea surface height and the water column components are quite different from one another. Um, and although they're generally, you know, mostly opposite, clearly they're not perfectly opposite and they result in this uh, kind of ramp of sorts. And so looking at the model, I was curious, okay, we see this signal, uh, what's causing it. And so um, what I found is that in many cases, these ramps are caused by mesoscale eddies um, in the model. And so mesoscale just means kind of order of 100 kilometers diameter. Um, and uh, what I'm showing here on the left is, a, again, a map of the um, uh, 
uh, uh, Cascadia region and basically a trace of an eddy that propagated um, through the system. Um, and so in this particular timestamp, we're just looking at uh, the sea surface height. The eddy currently is kind of this, at, at this time, is this red blob underlying point C. But basically this eddy through the period of um, a couple of months kind of propagated through the system and then out onto the abyss in a way. Um, and uh, I plotted uh, pressure differences um, kind of along the track of this eddy. Um, and so in this case, uh, we're, we're at point C. And um, as the eddy passes through, we get in the total, again, plotted in red, this ramp-like signal, and we see that kind of characteristic difference in steric and eustatic components. Um, and so this was really just like kind of a preliminary study and just a kind of a, an initial look at these models. But throughout um, the kind of several years of the model um, that I had access to, um, I was able to pick out a number of eddies, both kind of cyclonic and anticyclonic eddies um, that move through the system, and all of them show this kind of characteristic like ramp signal. So um, kind of just a starting point, but showing that um, these eddies are at least one source of um, kind of confounding signals that might confuse us when we're looking for slow slip. Um, so there's a lot of future work that could be done here. I think there are more features than just eddies uh, that I could dig into, such as coastal trapped waves, um, which are basically standing waves that propagate off the shelf break. Um, meanders in bottom current, um, or coastal currents rather, um, internal waves, there are lots of features generated in the water column um, that are likely to result in a, kind of a different pressure at one location than another, even if they're at the same depth. So in the future, I really hope to um, further explore uh, these different processes and also to do this in a way that builds up a more kind of statistical picture of um, what might be generating um, some of these residual signals in our pressure traces. Okay, so I won't repeat that, um, but uh, now we can move on to what I'm doing here at UTIG and talk a bit about the Hikarangi subduction zone. Okay, so uh, just a little bit of uh, kind of context and background. Um, this is a picture of New Zealand's North Island um, and the Hikarangi subduction zone um, kind of underlies this island and extends offshore. Um, and um, here we have the Pacific plate subducting beneath the Australian plate um, obliquely. And so kind of at different rates as you go from the north to the south. Um, and Laura Wallace uh, has done a lot of work in this setting, both on land and offshore and um, has, um, demonstrated the uh, kind of existence and prevalence of slow slip earthquakes uh, here, both um, kind of beneath land and offshore into the ocean. Um, and so this is um, a figure of um, kind of locking in the subduction zone. So red representing um, a high degree of locking and blue kind of stable sliding. Um, oops, wrong button. Um, and so what I just wanna point out here is that, yeah, the very different locking behavior from north to south um, as well as these kind of green contours showing kind of characteristic locations of slow slip um, in this region. Um, and what's really cool here is that because of the presence of this slow slip, um, um, kind of first observed onshore with GPS, but, but now um, increasingly offshore, um, there is really like a one of a kind recurring observational network here um, that every year is deployed to capture the offshore component of these slow slip events. Um, and uh, just to kind of emphasize that there are a lot of these, um, I just have the map of the North Island here and a couple of GPS stations picked out with these triangles and the colors correspond to these traces here that again, kind of like at the beginning of the talk, show this kind of ongoing displacement to the West and then periodic jumps to the East. Um, and I just wanna point out that as you move from the South to the North, you kind of get different recurrence interval of these um, events. And sometimes they happen in certain regions, but not in others. So it's a really dynamic system with different things kind of happening um, from one end of the margin to the other. Um, and there have been a couple past studies that um, talk about these offshore slow slip events, one being a 2014 event um, off Gisborne, which is kind of in the north part of the North Island. Um, and then one for a 2019 event that took place off Gisborne as well as off Hawke's Bay, which is a little bit more to the south. So there's a lot of um, uh, uh, opportunity here um, for observing offshore slow slip. Um, I also wanna point out that just in general, Hikarangi is a really great place to be working because there are a lot of recent studies coming out trying to like understand um, um, the subduction zone here and particularly understand these slow slip phenomenon. So just to point out a few, um, paper, paper by uh, Sridharan um, about ultra slow frictional healing, explaining these slow slip events. Um, paper by Chesley et al. about um, fluid-rich subducting topography and how that affects 
um, um, fluid pressures in the subduction zone and contributes to the slow slip. Um, this recent paper, which has gotten a lot of press, um, again, about subducting fluid, um, resulting in the slow slip phenomenon. Um, and uh, for those of you who are at Evans, uh, Evan Solomon's seminar just the other week, he was talking about some of the fluid data um, coming out of the Hikarangi margin and how that relates to slip and many more. So there's a lot of different studies kind of coming at this um, slow slip problem. And it's, 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 an, it's an interesting time to be working here. Um, and so, like I said, there have been these regular um, seafloor deployments. Um, these are just some maps um, from 2014. And I guess I stopped in 2022, but they're ongoing um, into the present, uh, just showing these kind of recurring um, seafloor deployments to observe, observe these phenomena. So again, a lot of opportunity for me um, to dig into these slow slip events um, using records of seafloor pressure. And as I said, these continue on into the future. Um, just yesterday, I got back from field work um, in New Zealand, um, and we were um, collecting and then redeploying um, the sensors off Gisborne here. Um, and so there was uh, kind of a large group of us. Um, it's a really collaborative effort of different organizations, including UTIG, uh, GNS in New Zealand, as well as some groups in Japan um, and um, Lamont Doherty um, out of Columbia. Um, so really big collaborative effort that results in, you don't have to worry about what each of these points are, but a lot of instruments on the seafloor, which as I said, is, is a very rare thing. Um, and I just want to point out uh, that it's just, it's a ton of work. Each of these points represents so much work to get that instrument prepared, um, quality controlled, um, ensure everything's working properly. And then you throw it off a boat, you come back a year later, hope that you can get it back and that all the data is there. And it's just, it's a tremendous amount of work. And um, the, the ship's crew, as well as um, the techs who are like working on these instruments, like they're just so invaluable to making each of these time series happen. And I'm just really grateful for the amount of work that goes into that. Um, so kind of this like first things first, the techniques that I showed in Cascadia and Alaska work really well in Hikarangi. Um, so this is just a selection of pressure data from the 2021 to 2022 deployment. Um, and if we apply this, you know, kind of depth matched um, proxy correction, dramatic reduction in um, residual oceanography. So great, the first order, it works really well. And, you know, uh, if, you know, if nothing else comes out of the work I did in my, my thesis, I just wanna show on this map of the deployment in Hikarangi that they now deploy sensors to the north and to the south of the main network to use as corrections. So um, my work resulted in instruments on the seafloor. And if nothing else happens, like I have that, I will always have that. Um, but there is some cool stuff already coming out of these data. Um, for one, in this 2021 to 2022 deployment, um, there appears to be slow slip deformation captured on multiple instrument types. Um, and so in this plot here, I'm showing coastal GPS just from a few stations um, nearest to where the deformation occurred. And we can see that eastward step um, taking place. Um, here in the center plot, I, I didn't really talk about these, but another really cool thing we have in this region as marked by the red dots, are um, what are called cork observatories. So these are ODP drill sites um, where they've installed pressure sensors um, at depth beneath the margin. Um, and you're basically measuring the formation pressure of uh, um, that layer in the, um, in, the, in, the, the, in the overriding plate. And um, these are great because they're, as things slip, you're basically getting a strain meter. The fluid gets, you know, compressed or relaxed, and that registers as an increase or decrease in pressure. And so you're seeing here those changes in pressure basically acting as a strain meter in the formations um, at these two um, sites. And so we see these transient processes related to slip there. And then at the top, finally, we have um, some pressure records that also show um, a, co a coherent, these are, co these are already corrected with that depth matched um, technique, and we see a coherent signal um, there. And what's really interesting about these is very preliminary. There are still things I need to work out um, with the pressure data, but it's really interesting that the time scales here are all the same, uh, the time axes. And so we see this really interesting uh, temporal progression um, in this setting. So I think that um, kind of in general with these um, Hikarangi data, my kind of place in everything and my piece is adding this increased sensitivity is going to really let us pick out like the small scale detail of these events. So it's not just that we know that we're ha they're happening, we know when they are, we know where they are, we know um, kind of more precisely the amount of deformation, which then tells us what, you know, in a really detailed way what's going on on the fault interface. <laughs>
Um, so another piece I want to talk about just briefly in Hikarangi um, is this idea of instrumental drift. And so I skipped this before. Um, but the general idea is that these pressure sensors that we use, they're really sensitive. Um, so if it weren't for the amount of oceanographic noise, like we, in theory, could be measuring like millimeter scale deformation of the seafloor, which is, I think is pretty incredible. Um, but one issue they have is this, what's called this sensor drift effect. And so I've plotted here just the pressure record from one of the early slides, as well as um, these figures from Polster et al., which are laboratory studies of these pressure data. And in all of these, you can see this kind of exponential um, decaying to linear um, signal um, on the pressure um, time series here. And the, the time scale of the exponential is months, weeks, it depends on the sensor. Um, but basically, this is an entirely instrumental signal. You can have these in isolation in the lab, and they will generate the signal. You put them on the seafloor, they're also going to generate the signal. But stacked on top of it is all your oceanography. And picking those things apart from one another is, is very difficult um, because you Although you can measure this, this effect in the lab, you can take the sensor and put it in the ocean, and it's going to have a totally different drift. So it'll still be exponential and linear, but the the constants, the 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 yeah, the time constants and everything are going to be different. And so this again is just like an effect that really obscures um, the data that we're collecting, and it's hard to, to pick these things apart. But what's cool about the Hikarangi data set is we have um, a number of what are called A0A sensors, um, which we just deployed for the or sorry recovered for the first time. Um, when I was just out there and they've been redeployed. So we'll soon have uh, kind of two years of these data set and, or these types of data. And basically what these do is here's the pressure record from just one of these. So the, you know, kind of really big dominating signal is basically your tides uh, dominating your pressure record, but you see these kind of like spikes throughout the time series. And these are intentional. And every time that you see one of these spikes, what's happening is the pressure gauge is switching and instead measuring, measuring the internal pressure of the pressure case. And so we're here, you know, kind of down near about 1,000 pascals, just atmospheric pressure. Um, and so what we're doing is we're basically measuring our drift against the known stable pressure of the pressure case. And we're doing that every week um, throughout like the year of this deployment. And what that'll let us do is basically plot, you know, little points along our um, uh, drift curve and because we're measuring the internal pressure of the case, we're not subject to any of the oceanographic pressures or slow slip or anything. And so we'll be able to pull out that drift signal and have like a totally corrected um, pressure record. And this has been demonstrated in a couple of kind of lab studies, as well as a deployment by William Wilcock um, on a uh, uh, off Monterey Bay. Um, and so this technique has been demonstrated to work. And now we have about a dozen of these instruments distributed throughout the um, region of slip or, or the region of slow slip, and we'll be able to get this nice, um, well corrected um, time series uh, or number of well corrected time series. And what's cool about this is that, in addition to kind of cleaning up our slow slip picture, we hope that we'll also be able to get at the kind of ongoing deformation component um, that, that should be recorded by these pressure data. So, much like the GPS, in between slow slip events, um, the, 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 seafloor is deforming with ongoing convergence, so mostly subsiding as the plate subducts, right? And that's really hard to pick out because it's a very subtle signal distributed over a really long time period, and it gets conflated with this instrumental drift signal. So by pulling this out, any residual kind of long-term um, signal should be attributable to this ongoing convergence. So really excited to, to dig into these data and pick that out. All right, the last thing I think I'll say um, is just Again, emphasizing the really like the uniqueness of these um, Hikarangi deployments in general, but especially uh, the data set that's going to come out next year from what we just put in the ground. There's just a huge number of different instrument types that have resulted from the kind of ongoing studies here and the um, kind of continued and um, renewed collaborations. So in addition to just our standard pressure, like I just talked about, we have um, our A0A sensors. We also have some sensors that are called CPIs, um, which those of you who or maybe more in the oceanography sphere might know about, but basically they're capable of making oceanographic measurements as well as bottom pressure measurements. Um, in the, there, are a couple, there are two GNSSA sites, um, which is basically a, a, a GPS sensor on the seafloor um, that uses kind of acoustic communication to determine its position. Um, and that'll give horizontal deformation. We also have the cork observatories giving formation pressure. And then there's OBS. Um, that record tremor associated with these uh, slow slip events. So all told, there's all these different pieces that come together um, to give us this, this really detailed picture of what's going on um, in the shallowest segment um, of the Hikarangi subduction zone.
Okay, so just to kind of repeat, I think that my kind of place in all of this is really, you know, improving our resolution, which then improves our constraints on, on this slow slip piece, you know, where, when, and like how much slip are we seeing? And then how does that fit into our understanding of um, kind of the entire subduction cycle, but particularly this offshore um, component of it in Hikarangi. Okay, and so with that, I'll just um, thank and acknowledge um, my advisors here at UTIG, Laura Wallace, Damian Safer, and Patrick Heimbach. I also want to thank my doctoral committee, which was the majority of this presentation. Um, so William Wilcock, John Delaney, Joan Gomberg, Susan Hautala, Parker McCready, David Schmidt, and Harold Tobin, um, all at the University of Washington. Um, there's also many other people to thank, but in particular, um, engineers at OOI and APL who um, helped with a lot of the, the doctoral work, and then the crews of the RV Thompson, Ravel, Sukuliak, and most recently Tangaroa, um, without whom like this work is just is not possible, and funding from the NSF and, and Parascientific Inc. All right, so I'll put the results back up and take questions. Okay. Great, thanks, Eric, or Constantino. Did everybody clap? That was an awesome talk. I can't hear. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, we'll go ahead and um, move into questions. And before we take some from the audience, while Constantino is preparing the cube mic, we do have a question from online from Chow Yang Zhang, who asked me to ask Eric this question on his behalf. Um, Eric, during these slow slip events, are there any observations of temporal changes in gravity that you're aware of? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I'm not aware of any changes in gravity. Um, certainly not in Hikarangi. I don't think, and Laura can correct me if I just don't know, but I don't think that's been observed in general with the off these offshore slip, slow slip events. Um, yeah, that's a good question. The, and the answer is, I don't know. Um, I, I, yeah, it'd be worth looking into. Sorry, that's not a very satisfying answer, but it's the one I have. <laughs> That's the one I would give to because <laughs> I'm not aware of any um, any any studies looking at that, but it does seem like that's something that could be. Um, so I think Constantino, since most of the people are in the room, you're going to wrangle um, question. You're going to wrangle question askers from your end because I can't see anyone. Yeah, and we've got a question from Gail. Uh, yeah, so I had a question. That, that was an interesting talk. Um, so I've heard a lot about DPGs also mm. and. From what you showed, APGs have a lot of processing in order to get a signal. What what can you get from the DPGs? Yeah, so um, just for everyone, um, so we're on the same page, APG means absolute pressure gauge and DPG means differential. Um, so there's different um, ways of measuring pressure and they have kind of different constraints and different strengths and weaknesses. Um, DPGs, uh, Basically, they're they're um, kind of constrained to shorter periods. So I might misquote this, but I want to say that they don't really have good um, long term, like long period resolution above like a thousand seconds or something. So it's not really long enough um, to observe these um, days to weeks to maybe even months type signals. Um, that being said, uh, this is like totally speculative, but I think something that could be really interesting that as far as I know, no one's really looked at would be like, are there kind of, you know, short term signals affiliated with these uh, slow slip events, you know, that then you know kind of add up or stack up to this long term signal that we see in the APGs. So um, I think that there's maybe potential there to see, you know, these processes like in action, um, potentially, but um, in terms of looking at kind of like the total def deformation, um, they're just not sensitive to that that long time period. Thank you. That was a really good talk. I have lots of questions, but I'll just ask one for the moment. So um, for your kind of depth correction, how how same does the depth have to be? Gosh, that was terrible words. No, no, that's great. Thank you. I, I should have said that. So yeah, that's um, I didn't really dig into the, the, the details about this kind of depth correction, but um, basically as you move into increasingly shallow waters, your depth matching has to be like increasingly strict. So if you're at least in, you know, where we've looked in Cascadia and Alaska, um, the stations were distributed, like not just on um, the slope, but also like on the shelf. 
Um, so in shallow waters, like 100 meters depth, sometimes even less. And in those cases, it still worked, which is pretty remarkable, because if you know anything about just kind of, you know, ocean dynamics, like in shallow water, a lot is happening and a lot reaches the bottom. It's just really messy, really dynamic. And so even in these really shallow waters near the coast where you're getting crazy like wave action, input from like rivers, et cetera, if you match depths, you get like this skill, this remarkable coherence over like hundreds of kilometers. Um, but you have to be matched like practically to the meter, like five meters, maybe 10 meters uh, difference allowed. As you go into increasingly deep water, so even like further off the shelf, like 200 meters depth, you know, you get maybe a couple tens of meters, you go down even deeper to like a thousand meters depth, right? It increases until the point where, at least in Cascadia, once you get to like the lower slope, it's like the lower slope and the abyss are all just seeing like the same pressure pretty much over like huge like separations. Um, and something that's interesting that, that again, I think, um, you know, I could dig into now that I kind of have access to these Hikarangi data as well, is like the differences between settings. So, um, you know, these kind of numbers that I cited, they're like, you know, back of the envelope type things. But in each setting, like there are kind of these, you know, strict rules or whatever. And they're not the same between Cascadia and Alaska. They're similar, but they're not the same. And similarly, you know, in, in Hikarangi, they're not quite the same. So um, I think picking out the details there could potentially be interesting and could you know, again, thinking about like the actual oceanographic origins of these things, potentially really interesting informing you like where these different circulation processes are happening and how that relates to kind of like the depth or the position really relative to the, the continental shelf that you're in. And can you just quickly comment on your, in Hikarangi, your little uh, satellite yeah. depth ones? So are they good enough? Uh, are you at a depth for the rest of the stations that just yeah, those so ones are going to be good enough to correct the whole of them? Yeah, so network. something that's, uh, you know, I, I guess I didn't emphasize in Hikarangi that I should have is that like this network is like much smaller aperture than what I was looking at in Cascadia and Alaska. Um, so like all of these stations, except for the the kind of reference ones, they're very close together. It's like no more than 30 kilometers, you know, apart, like between stations, you know, it's, it's, it's not much. Um, and also they're all kind of deployed on the slope. So there's nothing up on, you know, the continental shelf. There's not even too much really like up closer to the shelf break. They're all quite deep. Um, so that's kind of a caveat. Um, but that being said, you know, these reference stations, which there's just kind of a couple of them um, to the north and a couple to the south, but they're kind of deployed at like every couple hundred meters. Um, well, maybe that's not quite true. Let's say every 500 meters or something. Um, but they seem to work very well. Very much. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, thanks. Very good talk. Uh, I have a question about Alaska. You know, uh, they are they are uh, slow sleep even detected. I just got look at a paper right now. The people detecting like thirty one slow sleep event over a period of fourteen years, but they they're pretty deep, mm. like thirty five to forty five yeah. kilometers depth. So, what would it take to to be able to see that with pressure pressure sensors, or is it too deep or yeah, so I would think that those deep events are also happening, you know, kind of further inland, right? Yeah, um, sure. So I think, you know, for the same reason that our land data aren't great at seeing to the offshore, I don't think our pressure is the right measurement to, you know, huh. be observing those. Um, that being said, you know, different subduction zones do have different subduction angles, right? And Hikarangi is one that's um, fairly shallow. So you are going to get not maybe, you know, 30, 35 kilometers, right? But you will get differences. Um, and the depth at which these things are occurring, if they're occurring, and that will affect your sensitivity. Um, so yeah, I guess the short answer is that pressure is not the right tool to be measuring the deep slip events. Um, but I think in, you know, in combination, having like a robust onshore network, a GPS network or whatever it may be, and then having an offshore um, network does give you this really nice um, ability to understand kind of the dynamics you know, on the shallow end and on the deeper end of the uh, seismogenic zone. Yeah, okay, yeah. And, uh, you know, when you went to Alaska, you were hoping to find shallow slow sleep events? Yes, or? yes. And there are evidence for that before? Or? So there's never evidence for that before, nor was there in Cascadia. Um, although both settings have, you know, observations of the deeper type of slow slip. Yeah. Um, and then I, I guess I should also say that um, there was a, an alter, alternate study um, using the Alaska data that used basically trained and used a machine learning model to look for slow slip. And they identified the potential um, for some signal on those same data. Um, and uh, yeah, it's messy. So it's, it's, you know, looking at it with my eye, 
I I didn't see anything. Um, but I absolutely do not think that means that it wasn't there. It's it's complicated, and Alaska is a case where the subvection angle is quite steep. The instruments are deep. There's a lot of reasons why, if there were deformation, it would be quite subtle. Um, and I think I'm sure all of us have oh, read yeah. various machine learning papers, right, where they pull things out that you wouldn't be able to see with your eye. So it's I think it's very possible, but it's just it's tricky. And not not finding them is also a result, you know. Sure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Do, do we have any more questions from the audience? Uh, yeah. Yes, we do. One, one, oh, one. <laughs> um, so in like Alaska and Cascadia, you, you sort of showed how you found these eddies, but do you see any like temporal change in oceanographic signals like through years or is it? Yeah, so um, that's, a, yeah, that's a great question. And I think that's another thing that, the models could potentially be really useful for, as well as something I'd like to do um, with these like multi-year, almost a decade of redeployments in Hikarangi is myself and you know and others who have looked at this. We've kind of pulled out these results and say like, look, this works, but we're just looking at twelve months of data, fourteen months of data, right? And you know, assuming that if you went back out and redeployed, you'd get the same result, and we really don't know that. Um, and we know there are, you know, to kind of name like a big obvious one, there are effects like ENSO that totally modulate uh, oceanography, um, you know, on kind of this interannual basis. And I think that's something that needs to be explored. I think that's it. Do you want to wrap things up, Laura? Sure. Um, unless there's any anybody online who has any questions, if you do raise your hand. No? Well, um, then I guess we will, can we thank Eric again for his really great talk? Thank you so much. It's good to see this. And um, yeah, and everybody enjoy Friday and have a good weekend. <laughs> Thanks, Eric.